Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Chen Wang, who's going to talk today about the use of embedded FPGAs in neural networks. Chen, there's a lot of talk these days about artificial intelligence, about neural networks, machine learning. There's also a lot of different chips that are being thrown out there for use in this, uh, GPUs, CPUs, um, even DSPs. What works best and why and where? Well, like most problems, there's no clear answer to one solution because there is multiple problems we're trying to solve. There is one set of problems where people are trying to come up with the most efficient neural network for certain classes of problems. For example, DNNs, you know, for ranking, or you know, recurrent neural networks for you know, voice and speech. And then there is convolutional neural networks for mostly so far image recognition and video recognition. So there is no one size fit all. And within those categories, people are constantly changing and tweaking the architecture in order to get to the, the most uh, versatile solution that will solve the most of their problems with what they call the least loss, which is the least amount of error. So there is, there is many problems people are trying to solve at the same time. And within each neural network, there is all kinds of classes of hardware that can be applied for two stages. Stage one is to train the hardware in order to correctly predict um, the outputs based on your training sets of data. And that's for training. And then when actually people are pre performing inference, which is when they're running them in the real world, this is stage two, where the network is designed and trained, and they are trying to simply deploy them by solving real problems with them. So let's back up and take a look at this uh, visually. Sure. So what are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is actually a very simplified, fully connected neural network. This has got a set of inputs and a set of outputs. The inputs, in this case, it's one dimensional. It could be something simple like a segment of speech or uh, something two dimensional would be like a frame of an image. And the output would be something um, that the machine is expected to produce with some accuracy. For example, uh, if, it, if you are looking at a picture, is it a cat, is it a dog, is it a bird, or is it a car? You know, every one of those is it questions will be a tr a generally a true or false, and the machine is supposed to produce one that's got the highest probability as one that's most likely to be. And that's one of the things about machine learning and AI is that you're actually dealing in probabilities rather than fixed numbers. So two of your most important things here are how much does it take you to get to a computational result as well as how fast can you get to that, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So because it's in probability, people tend to assume that you need a lot of precision and CPUs, GPUs, floating point, it all come about. And they are so far based on the research quite necessary for training purposes because it is highly complex, com uh, convex optimization problem where you are trying to solve um, you know, a number of optimization parameters in order to get to a solution that has the least amount of loss, the least amount of error. But when you actually deploy them in field for inferencing, what the, co what the researchers have, have shown is you actually have very little error introduced by using 8-bit integer numbers. And certainly the computation complexity becomes much smaller and an 8-bit floating point unit is oh, an 8-bit fixed point integer point unit is much much smaller than a 32-bit 64-bit floating point unit and this diagram might look very simple it's just got a few lines here and there but actually every one of those lines in a fully connected layer like here is actually a multiply and accumulate unit so you count the number of lines that's how many floating point 64-bit multiply and accumulate, which we call max, you, you're going to need. And reducing that to an 8-bit precision is tremendous and enable actually a lot of new class of hardware, such as even FPGAs and some cases ASICs, in order to um, build these very efficiently because we no longer need these huge floating point units. Does it change at all as we start moving into probabilistic types of algorithms versus the kind that have been used so far? Um, unlikely, because even though it's an 8-bit integer point, those 8-bit integers are actually used 
with a decimal point not in the very end but somewhere in the middle of the 8-bit therefore it's producing a fractional number a probability and even when it's predicting is it a bird is it a cat it's never saying yes or no it's saying more like this most likely yes with a 90 percent chance it's a dog and one percent chance is a cat one percent chance is a car and so on and so forth so it's already fractional point or probabilistic even though it's an integer point representation one of the arguments these days is that an ASIC will always be the, a better tool for this. The problem is that the market is changing so fast. The algorithms are changing so fast that if you create an ASIC, you're basically stuck with whatever you've created, right? Absolutely. There is tons of chips companies out there trying to solve this AI problem. Um, for training, there's absolutely no way an ASIC would do the job. In fact, even though I'm a firm believer of FPGAs in many applications, I believe CPUs and GPUs, especially GPUs, are probably going to be the best solution in the on the horizon um, from now till the near future um, for training purposes. But for inference, when we're actually deploying these networks, um, ASIC are the most efficient by far if this network will never change. But we're in such a rapidly evolving time where the architectures are changing and, the, and these uh, values and weights, what they call weights is one component of the multipliers are constantly being updated. And then there is so many uh, fluctuating factors in this neural network space that there's frankly cannot be a two-year ASIC design cycle that will fit people's needs but because by then the architecture would have moved on. It's got to be a flexible enough solution in order to be adapt adaptable to a variety of architectures and a variety of structures and functions that these uh, networks would need to perform without being inefficient like a CPU. So what's the overhead you have to worry about on this versus what you would have in an a as an ASIC? So some of the ASIC companies are out there, some of the startups are trying to get to 100x improvement. Yes. What do you get to with a, an FPGA, or an, and in particular an embedded FPGA? Yes. Well, those two things are, are quite different. An ASIC can get to 100x given the ideal solution uh, 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 scenarios. For example, are you bandwidth limited by memory? If you're bandwidth limited by memory, there is nothing to be gained from going to an ASIC, unless, of course, there's a fundamentally different architecture. And I think the FPGA here is something um, fundamental, is it can actually give you a lot of these multiply accumulate units, and it can tremendously reduce the amount of memory access that is required compared to a CPU or GPU-based implementation. And we believe that those two key, key advantages, the, the number of Macs available and the amount of bandwidth required, um, is going to put FPGA at a significant step above where the CPUs and the GPUs are. May be close to 100x like the ASICs, may not be quite there based on the applications, but it will be significantly better than the memory heavy CPUs and GPUs based solutions. Is it easier to debug as well because you do have that flexibility? Um, it could be the case, but to be frank, um, in an inference engine, when it is deployed, um, people are generally less concerned about debugging. People are more concerned about debugging their architecture, tuning their architecture in the training phase, or what they call the testing phase. But those are still generally done on the GPUs. When we come to inference, when this is deployed, this is nothing but a math problem. It simply needs to compute the math correctly for a given set of inputs. There will be a deterministic set of outputs. And those outputs should match regardless if you run them on the CPU, GPU, or the FPGA. It is simply doing a math problem. And it's also uh, because you're doing the inferencing, that's a much smaller data set than you would use on the training side too, right? Um, yes, it is a much smaller problem to solve. We no longer have to worry about tuning these parameters as we're training. We no longer have to worry about a lot of optimizations problem. It's purely a feed forward or in some kind of a recurrent neural network. There may be some feedbacks, but it is a data path problem. There is nothing to optimize at this point when we when it comes to execution. Simply get this done in the most efficient manner possible. What are we looking at now? All right, so we kind of uh, touched on the fact that ADFPJ is a different approach to this neural network problem. It has a lot of, of multiply accumulate units built into its fabric as well as a lot of logic 
Therefore, it is very easy for the data to flow through uh, from one DSP to the next through some control logic, through some activation functions. Those are all mapped into the FPGA without constant memory access. So the memory bandwidth is used almost exclusively for loading the data and loading the weights and not much else. And there is a fundamental advantage in this architecture when it comes to bandwidth e efficiency because of it's basically ASIC-like architecture but it's reconfigurable because it's reconfigurable by the FPGA fabric. However, even though this FPGA fabric is uh, used by some big companies nowadays because they deem it to be more efficient than the other alternatives, there is much more to improve. For example, FPGAs are traditionally not highly targeted for AI or neural network applications. Their uh, DSP occupy a small fraction of their overall area, maybe 10%, maybe even less. So these tend to be the bottleneck when we come to neural network applications because they require so many multiply accumulates and there is only a certain amount of those resources. And we've really just scratched the surface on where we can go with some of this stuff, right? Yes, exactly. So really, what can we do to optimize an FPGA, well, there's actually a lot more that we can do with an incremental amount of work from our side. And because we are a small and flexible team, we can actually implement these changes very quickly. So we can, for example, optimize a more neural network friendly tile with many, many more rows of these uh, 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 DSP units, which offers multiply accumulate capabilities. But in addition to having much more rows of them, each one of these MAC units multiply accumulate units and actually optimize for the AI sizes. Traditional FPGAs have multiply ac accumulate sizes that tend to be an overkill. For example, our traditional eFlex embedded FPGA, our max are 22 by 22 bit multipliers with a 48 bit accumulator. While in the neural networks, like we just touched on, it's mostly 8-bit multipliers and maybe a 16-bit accumulator. And therefore, by reducing the amount of uh, bits that we have to multiply and accumulate, we can actually fit about three times as many max in the same footprint. And by having more max and smaller max, we actually lead to more than a 10x gain in terms of number of multiply accumulate we can perform in roughly the same footprint as before. So basically, you're getting back to the same problem of uh, faster performance, uh, less uh, latency, more throughput, and exactly. also um, really targeting exactly what you need to compute. Exactly. So instead of having a fully general purpose tile, which we have available for all the ASIC designers and FPJ designers out there, this is a much more AI neural network targeted eFlex tile. Cheng Wang, thanks for a great explanation. No, thank you.